Hong, how are you? She, it's nice to see you again. You as well. I hope you're staying safe and healthy in this time. Um, yeah. So yeah, just so tell me uh, how are you dealing with, you know, staying at home? How has that been for you in this time? Well, you know, I am not someone who can complain about how this pandemic has affected him or her. I mean, I happen to, you know, I am able to live pretty comfortably in a beautiful city. And I, 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 I know how lucky I am. And I know that this pandemic is disproportionately affecting black and brown communities. I know that it's disproportionately affecting low income people and essential workers. And I know that there are communities that are very, very hard hit from a health standpoint and people who are, who've lost their jobs and are at great economic risk for themselves and their families going forward. And so, you know, I, I'm aware, I think this hits and hurts everybody, but it doesn't hit and hurt everybody equivalently hard. And I am aware of how lucky I am in the scheme of things. And I try and keep that in the forefront of my mind because I know there are people here who need support and need um, assistance from the government and from their fellow citizens. And, you know, those are people to, you know, that I try and pay attention to. Yeah, definitely. And I think that we can see the same level of inequality, how uh, things disproportionately affect some groups more than others with the climate crisis. So I was wondering, how do you see the linkage between the coronavirus pandemic and the climate crisis pandemic in terms of how we have been reacting to it and what we can learn from it? Well, that's a, that's a great question, Shia, because I think what Corona is doing is it's exacerbating some trends that were already in place. It's breaking some things that had weakness to them and it's exposing faults and injustice in society that always existed, but weren't as apparent as they probably should have been in terms of our politics and in terms of people's awareness. So, I mean, it's very clear that the very same communities of color who have had environmental injustice disproportionately inflicted on them in the, in the, in the forms of unsafe air and unsafe water, so that we were seeing it in terms of asthma rates and health problems and water that made people sick or killed them. Those same communities are communities where there's disproportionate infection of COVID-19, and also disproportionate mortality. And it's very clear the numbers, it's happening so fast that, you know, there's no way to sit. It's, it just brings to everybody's mind, here are the people who are sick. Here are the people who are dying. And whereas in climate or in air pollution and asthma, it's kind of goes on over a long period of time. There's no, you know, awful, short-term, immediate, horrific impact. There's a long-term, slow, gradual, horrific impact. What COVID is doing is exposing in a real way, in a very sharp way, the, that kind of injustice. And it's, so that's the first point. It's exposing something that existed before in terms of environmental injustice. Second of all, it's exposing what happens to leaders who don't trust data who, aren't, who don't believe in science, who put economics ahead of lives. And that's something that in, you can see what that's meant in terms of the results for Americans in terms of this coronavirus. But it's exactly the same thing in terms of climate, except once again in climate, it's a longer time frame. It takes more, there's not, there's not a one-time story where you go, oh my gosh, this many people died today. It's a more gradual, long-term thing that, you know, if, if we don't react to it and deal with the data and deal with the science, we'll have even bigger impacts 
than the coronavirus, but the coronavirus is like the canary in the coal mine. This is what happened to people who deny the truth. And I yeah. think the, the other thing, Shan, you should be, you know, absolutely, you know, I'm sure you are more aware of this than I am. Coronavirus is disproportionately killing people who are older. And our society is, it kills everybody. I mean, it, it kills young people, middle-aged people and old people, but it's disproportionately hurting people who are older and people with pre-existing conditions. The climate crisis is one which disproportionately is, is going to impact younger people, people your age. And so we can see in our society, you know, there, who gets hurt by these two huge worldwide pandemics is different, but we can see that when people are really threatened in a way that brings it home, this society has an ability to take extreme action to protect lives. And so for everyone who says we can't afford to deal with climate, I think as a result of COVID-19, we know that society can afford to deal with it. It may be extremely difficult, but we can afford to do it. And I think the way that we can deal with climate, we know we can do it that actually creates jobs, that actually makes people better employed, that actually creates justice and actually makes us grow faster. So I think there are things we can learn from COVID, but the biggest thing is it's exposing environmental injustice. It's disproportionately hurting black and brown people. And that's exposing something injustice that's been true for a long time. It's been at the heart of the climate crisis too. Yeah, I completely agree. I, we have seen the same things in our youth activism. Um, many of the systems that would be exposed by climate are being exposed by the coronavirus pandemic, such as the healthcare system, food security, supply chains. Now a lot of countries are saying we can't really get our things from China because you know, they were hit first. So now they want to domestify the supply chains, which would be beneficial for climate and for more just jobs in specific countries. Um, and you know, in terms of what you said about what we can learn from it, as youth activists, we can also say the whole world, all the governments have shown us that they can mobilize for a crisis. So now you owe it to us to show that you can mobilize for the climate crisis, just as you mobilize for COVID. And what you said about listening to the science, you're absolutely right. We stopped striking six weeks ago because we were listening to the science of how fast it spread and we couldn't gather in big groups. Uh, and that's what we're doing as well. Uh, my next question for you is, in terms of recovery, how are we going to transition because I've gotten this question a lot and I am like really looking forward to hear your thoughts. How do you think we can transition towards having green, good paying jobs after such a, like economic downfall that we've had like worldwide? Do you think it's possible to go towards green jobs from now? Oh, I absolutely do, Shia. I, I think you, th that's a question. The, the answer is a resounding yes. And let me just put, a little bit of context into how I see the economic impact of this pandemic. I mean, it has put us into economic freefall. You've, I'm sure everybody's seen the unemployment numbers from the last three or four weeks, which are at levels that we've never seen in the United States ever. And so we're seeing a commensurate federal government reaction in terms of support payments and pouring money uh, to the people of the United States who are unemployed or underemployed to try and keep people, you know, supported and remotely on their feet. But going forward, this, the economic impact of this virus is a huge demand destroyer in terms of people's abilities to buy goods and services in America. And so it's also, we have, this is a chance for government to step in and to rebuild the United States again, which we always have to do, but it's way overdue. I think everybody in America knows that we haven't done the rebuilding of America over the last couple of decades that we needed to do. So now's a chance to do that, to do that in a way that puts millions of people to work 
and to do it in a green way, to build an economy that is sustainable and green. And so I think when you say, is it possible to be green and to be employed? My answer is, I'm not sure it's possible to be employed without being green. And so as we look forward, I think this is a real chance for us to create the kind of self-sufficient economy that I think we're all looking for and one that's sustainable in terms of greenhouse gases and climate and also to use that necessary building program to build a lot of employment, to put people to work across the country in good paying jobs and to help pull us out of this uh, slump that we're in. Definitely, I really like your answer, your confidence in the answer because that's the type of straightforward yes that we need. Um, and I've also noticed a lot of people say, now that our pollution levels have gone down, we can see clear skies and it's wonderful. And I'm just thinking, this is what will happen when we transition to renewable energy. It doesn't take a global pandemic to have no pollution in our air. So that, I think that messaging is also gonna help uh, for people to realize that the era of fossil fuels, is, it's okay if we want it to be over because we have the solutions. Um, so my next question is, you ran for president for a long time and I really followed closely your campaign and I watched you on all the debates and I really appreciated that you always brought up justice and you always brought up frontline communities and climate. Um, and I thank you for that, for, from the perspective of, of a climate activist. And I was wondering if you, like you were envisioning yourself in a leadership position. So with that, how do you think we, like as not only as activists, but as citizens can make our leaders listen to what we're saying on, in terms of action? Right. Well, I mean, Gia, obviously, people running for office are interested in votes. And so they need to get enough people to vote to get into office. And those voters in turn need to use their vote, need to vote, especially young people. I'm, I'm sure you know, I started Next Gen America, which is the largest youth voter mobilization effort in American history. Basically saying young people are the swing vote and they're the swing vote in the sense of as many of them need to vote as possible because it's the biggest age group in American history. It's the most diverse age group in American history. And traditionally people at that age group in your generation have voted at half the rate of other American citizens. So your cohort, your generation is the swing vote for America looking towards the future. And so the first thing I'd say is everybody has to vote. But the second thing that people have to do is let the people who are running know why you're voting for them. Not just to vote, because if they don't understand how they got that vote, then they're free to do whatever they want. Mm. But if they understand that you voted for them because of climate, you voted for them because of justice, you know, you voted on it economic, environmental, and racial justice ticket, that puts pressure on them to live up to your expectations because you're what put them in office. And so for young people, I say it's absolutely first step, must vote in 2020 because the future, your future, our country's future, the planet's future is on the line this November 3rd. So you gotta show up. But secondly, I think it's important for whoever you're voting for, to let them know in some way, shape, or form why you're voting for them. And you know, we do, we try and make it possible for people to do that in a variety of ways. Politically, we also set up something with the League of Conservation Voters and the National Resource Defense Council called Give Green, which means if you're gonna make a contribution to a candidate for office, do it through this website so they know you're doing it because you care about environmental justice and the environment and climate. And so what I'm saying to young people is, and Earth Day is the perfect day to say this. If you're voting for the, first of all, you got to vote for the earth. And second of all, you got to let the politicians know that that's why you're voting for them. 
Because if we're going to, in fact, live up to the broadly justice-based idea of Earth Day, of sustainability and decency across our society, you got to vote and you got to tell people why you're voting, which is exactly what you're doing, Shia, is getting out there and making the point about what you care about and by extension, what people who are your age with your concerns care about. It's really important. Yeah, thank you for that answer because we, as youth activists, we are obviously gonna support those candidates who represent our values, our climate values, but we also have to make sure that we communicate to them that we agree with their policies because the communication has to go both ways. Um, and actually for this kind of Earth Week, we are having three days of action. Tomorrow, Wednesday is striking, Thursday is Divest Day, and Friday is voting, uh, which obviously very important. Um, and all of this is being done online because our next global climate strike was actually scheduled for tomorrow. And we were planning <laughs> on bringing hundreds of thousands of people to the street again. And that couldn't happen. And we have switched completely online. So I'm wondering, what do you think is the pluses and the minuses of moving into an online world, um, like considering that the elections are coming up? Well, it's funny because as I said, you know, I started Next Gen America, which is a grassroots organization traditionally where we were on in 2018, 421 college campuses, physically. And obviously, I believe of those 421 college campuses, zero are open right now. So we've, we've switched to, com we were always a big online organizer as well, but we've switched to completely online. As I said, part of what COVID does is it accelerates trends. We were already more online every single day than we were the day before, but now we're 100% online. And so that makes it, it's a challenge because there's some things which the world is set up to do easier face-to-face. -face. I mean, we also do a door-to-door a -door campaign with some national labor unions talking to people who are sporadic voters to try and convince them why their vote is so important called For Our Future. And that was a completely door-to-door -door operation. And now that's transitioned to being a completely online organization. So I think the positives are that you have an ability to reach more people and you have an ability to reach them more frequently. Mm. I think the hard part is, you know, I'm still, she, I'm old enough. I'm still a believer in face-to-face. -face. I still believe in human contact. I think that there's, I know that when I was campaigning for president, it was incredibly meaningful to me, just as a hardwired per human being to be able to see people and to hug them and to get a sense of who they are and where their heart is. And so, you know, I don't think I'm just being sentimental. There's some sentimental, sentimentality to it of saying, I just love connecting with people directly face to face. And I, you know, mourn that we're not able to do that right now because that's super important to me personally. But I think that the electronic means of connecting have a, you know, a scope and a reach and an immediacy that's impossible. You can't hug 320 million Americans, but you can reach them online. So there are pluses and minuses, but I think from a sort of spiritual standpoint, I, I miss direct human connection at that level. And I'm looking forward to when we can get back to it. Yeah, and I agree with that as well, because um, I forgot how much I love striking. Like having 300 <laughs> people, like, you know, having 300 people on the street in New York is so empowering. And I realized we're not striking for people who don't believe in climate change. We're striking because imagine if there were people striking for plastic bags, you wouldn't like, you know, you wouldn't support them uh, because that's not something that you believe in. So I thought it's the same thing with climate deniers. Even if they see like thousands of people in the street, they probably don't care that much. I realized it's more about us. It's more about our 
sense of unity, our sense of strength, our sense of community. Um, sorry, there's like an ambulance going by. So I'm gonna, hold on a second. <laughs> okay, I think they're gone. Uh, so I never realized that striking was really about the sense of community and empowerment that we give each other. Uh, and I have found that with this networking and these partnerships that we have built in person, we can rely on them online as well. It's just definitely harder. And I also agree that the spirituality aspect of it, the human connection aspect of it, is something that's like really important for us because it's like our humanity. Yeah. Um, but I also wanted to ask you, you mentioned vote on climate. You mentioned communication with candidates who support climate action and climate justice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's so noisy. I'm here. I'm so sorry. We just so you know, Shia, we can, I can hear you very clearly. Awesome. Okay. So you've mentioned voting on climate and communication with candidates who advocate for climate justice. I was thinking, what do you think we as youth should prioritize in our demands for politicians? And how do you think we can best support candidates who are climate champions? Well, you know, it's, that's a really great question, Shia, because I think that there is a tendency to look at kind of the platform to see what specific proposals the candidate has put forward and to figure out, you know, how those stack up. But I don't actually see it that way. To me, the question has always been, what are your priorities and what are your values? So that, for instance, if, if you had the perfect, from my standpoint, climate platform and it was your fifth priority, I would know that it would never get done. That you have four huge things to get done before it. And therefore, knowing how politics works in the United States, the chances are we'd never get to climate. So you might have a perfect on paper platform, but it's not particularly relevant to what's gonna happen in the world because you don't actually care very much about it. And if you did care more about it, it wouldn't be your fifth priority. And so when I think what people should be looking for and demanding is values and priorities. If someone says to you, I absolutely know that if this world keeps going this way in terms of environmental degradation, CO2 pollution, and climate change, that it will it, we risk the end of human civilization. That's someone who is going to do something about it. And, so, and if they say, this is my number one priority, when you talk to me about foreign policy, I'm aware this is a global problem. And unless the United States leads in terms of changing the whole world's policy on climate, it's not gonna happen. And I take that as a prime responsibility for the next president of the United States. That's an important statement. So sometimes, I mean, the funny thing about this year that I think there's a famous um, Sherlock Holmes story where the clue to who the murderer was, was that the dog didn't bark because the dog knew the murderer the dog didn't bark because there was no stranger coming to invade. And so a lot of times with, I, I think with people running for office, people running for president or Senate or you know any other high office, sometimes it's what the dog doesn't say that matters. So if they're not telling you, this is my top priority, or if they're not telling you, I recognize my deep responsibility to act on this, that's a huge point. If you have to ask them to get to elicit a response and they then have a well thought out program, that's not enough. You, people need to be proactive in telling you, Shia, I get it. I know where we are in the world. I can see where we're headed unless we make a dramatic change. And it's my responsibility if I get elected to lead that change. That's what you actually need to hear. And you can then get into all the specifics about you know, energy generation and manufacturing and transportation and all the different things, and they all matter. But what you really need to hear is, how much do you care about this? Why do you care about this? And where does it stand in your list of priorities? 
Yeah, that's actually a really good response because you're right. Even if somebody has a perfect climate mm -hmm. platform, if they're not telling me this is my lens or this is my number one thing, it's never going to get done. Um, I never thought about it that way. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. And I know that obviously right now the federal government, we have two choices on who's going to be president. And none of them primarily put climate at the, for, at the forefront. So I was wondering, do you think that with like senators and locally, we can still galvanize uh, that power that we need for climate action? Well, let me say this. We still have six and a half months until election day. And I think that there's a chance for candidates to make clear where their heart is over the next six and a half months. In effect, the general election really hasn't started. So I think you've got to give these candidates a chance to tell you where their heart is and who they are. And I don't think that's really, I know people think they know, but I think you've got to get, keep your mind open to the idea that, that we can have a candidate here who will step up on environmental justice, who will make climate, in this case, his number one priority. We've got, keep, I'd say to all the young people watching, please keep an open mind because I think there's a chance that we're gonna get a candidate who will really represent us on these issues. And I think, but the second thing that's true is this, I know the president can make a gigantic difference on this. I mean, the president leads foreign policy, the president can determine, you know, miles per gallon standards, renewable portfolio standards, building codes, how the US government permits drilling and how it buys energy. We're the biggest energy buyers in the world. So I know the president in and of his own, in this case, it's a his, not a his or hers, his own volition can control a huge amount. But it's also true that if we're gonna rebuild America and rebuild a sustainable green America, the money's gotta be allocated by Congress. And so we're gonna to have to have a Congress and a Senate that understands the responsibility here the historic responsibility to respond to the data, to respond to science, to make a dramatic turn and to ensure the health and safety of the American people and people across the world. And, you know, is, they can't do it on their own, honest to goodness. I mean, unless we had super majorities in both houses, the president's veto, you know, stops anything. So we really need to make sure that we're voting for people across the board who are willing to be responsible, accept science, care about the safety and health of American citizens, safeguard our future and preserve the earth. And that seems like a minimal request to me in the 21st century of somebody who wants to be a senior elected official in the United States of America, that they just care about Americans, care about our future and believe in science. But it seems like that's not true right now of everybody and by a long shot. And that's why, you know, that's why I spent so much time here. That's why you're protesting on front. You've been protesting on Fridays for that, which seems like the minimum, but we're not getting it. And so that's why I've been working for well over a decade, because it's like hard to believe that we don't have that. And so I think we need to show up. I think we need to insist on this. I don't think there's a, you know, the idea that, you, that elected officials are supposed to sa preserve the health and safety of American citizens, that's not supposed to be something that's debatable. That's not supposed to be something you're supposed to compromise about. That's supposed to be an absolute fact. And I think we should make that an absolute fact. Yes, I agree with that as well. What we're asking for is the very minimum. What we're asking for is for people to care about like our health, our livelihoods, our dignified livelihoods, especially for frontline communities who are always Absolutely. Wealthy. Um, I think those are all the questions that I have for you. This was really awesome. If you have any other things that you want to talk about. Uh, well, I'd like to say one last thing, Shia. Yeah, go and ahead. And that's this. Look, I mean, at some level, we have to all 
justify our existence on the planet in terms of stepping up and doing what's good for every living being, for our, each other, for humans, for sure, but our responsibility to take care of the, all humans, but especially the most vulnerable, and to preserve the earth. And so this is Earth Day. And we're talking about what the responsi our responsibility as human beings to each other and to the planet is. And to me, doing that and taking on that responsibility gives a meaning to life and a dignity to, to all of our lives that is really, really important. And so, of course, we're doing it to preserve and protect the people that we know, we've looked at, we love, but we're also doing it at some level to explain and justify our own humanity and our reason for being. And that's where we are on Earth Day. Yeah, I agree. And one of my the favorite things that I've heard is, you know, Earth Day should be every day because our, that connection should be present as a habit, not as, you know, a hobby or a day. Uh, so yes, thank you so much for getting on this conversation with me. I actually learned a lot about uh, what youth engagement looks like with politicians. I think that that is something that we have to brush up on because personally, I'm not really into the um, more advocacy side like Sunrise Movement or other like organizations like that. And that is mainly because I focus on organizing strikes and like speaking to people. But these are really good points that I will keep in mind so that more youth are informed and know what to do with candidates they support. I'm registered to vote. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to talk to you, Shia. It's nice to see you again. You as well.